every form of life has its enemies. Insects have to fear birds. Birds have to fear cats. Cats have to fear dogs. Even we humans have things to fear. We have to try to cross roads sometimes in traffic. Uh, we have to fear germs. Everybody has an enemy. But the life that is real that we talked about last week also has an enemy. And that enemy is sin. Get your Bibles and you're going to need them today because we're going to be staying mo mostly in this one book of the Bible. 1 John chapter 1. And I'm going to start reading in verse 5 and read down through verse 6 of chapter 2. 1 John 1 starting in verse 5. And look for our enemy as we read through this. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of, of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought to himself also to walk just as he walked. Nine times in these verses, if you were counting, which I'm sure you weren't, but if you had been, John mentions sins just in that short paragraph of passages that we read. And then he uses the contrast of light and darkness. You probably picked up on that very easily, didn't you? He calls sin one thing and he says the opposite of that is light. But another contrast that you may have seen in there is also the contrast between just saying and doing. Did you pick up on that? If you say, if you say, if you say, look at verse 6 again. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, what about it? We lie and do not practice the truth. Drop down to verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Drop down to verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And then chapter 2, verse 4. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So you have the contrast between light and darkness. And then you have the contrast of saying and doing. And surely we can pick up very quickly that it's not enough just to say we are something. Our actions have to back up what we claim to be. It's clear that our Christian life is to amount to more than just mere talk. We must also walk in the light and live what we say that we believe. But if we're living in sin or walking in darkness, as this passage talks about, then our lives will contradict what our lips are saying. And what does that make us? It makes us a hypocrite, doesn't it? We say we're one thing. Our action says something else. We're hypocrites. But I also want us to know by way of introduction that in this great book, this great letter that John wrote, we'll find that sin is more than just an outward disobedience. Sin also comes from within. It's, it's, it's a sense of inner rebellion or desire. For instance, 1 John 2 verse 16, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Where does that begin? Not on the outside. It begins on the inside. Look at 1 John 3 verse 4. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself. Uh, drop down to verse 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. So sin begins on the inside. And what is sin? Ultimately, it is a refusal to do what God commands us to do. It is breaking 
transgression going beyond God's law. So if a Christian decides in his mind, whether or not you've ever formulated this in your mind, you know what, today I'm going to disobey God's law. That's probably what, not something you've ever done. However, your actions have done that. It is a rebellion starting from within and coming on the out. If we desire to live an independent life apart from God, then how can we possibly walk with God? How can we walk in the light if our actions go against, go in opposite direction of the way God is going? Amos 3 verse 3 says, can two walk together except they be agreed? Well, the answer is no. The answer is no. So if we are walking in darkness and living in light, we must deal with our sins. That's the enemy. If we are walking in darkness while saying we are living in light, then there's something we've got to deal with and our enemy is sin. If we want to walk in the light as he is in the light, then we've got to take care of that big adversary, sin. We're going to look at that in three ways covered in this. The first one, the first two we're going to look at this morning. The third one we're going to look at this afternoon. Number one, we can try to cover our sins. We can try to cover our sins. John deals with that. And let me tell you something. This part is going to hit us square right between the eyes. Some of this and maybe even in your own life. Number two, we can confess our sins. And then this afternoon, number three, we'll look at conquering our sins. What can we do? This sin problem that is in the lives of people and may even be in the lives of people who claim to be Christians. What can we do to overcome this? Well, we can try to cover our sins. We can try to cover our sins. Look at 1 John chapter 1 verse 5 again. It says, in him is light. Uh, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Listen to some other passages and you can write these down for your study later on if you want to look at this deeper. But when we obey, we are called by God out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9. We then become children of light. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 Verse 5, those who do wrong hate light. John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. And then when the light shines on us, it reveals our true nature. That's what light does, doesn't it? It reveals what's really there. It reveals what's really there. Have you ever been called into your children's room at night because there's a monster under the bed? Because there's a monster in the closet? Because there's a monster somewhere in the room? What do you do? You turn on the light and you say, look under your bed. See, no monster. Look in your closet. See, no monster. Look, the foot of your bed. See, there's no monster. There's nobody in this room except you. You see, light exposes what truly is there? Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 13. But all things are exposed and made manifest in the light. Who is light? God is light. He's going to expose what is truly there. There is no middle ground. It's light and darkness. It's not gray. It's not a little bit light. It's not a little bit darkness. It's one or the other. Light exposes what truly is there. And so what can we do with that? Well, we can try to cover up our sins. We can try to hide our sins. And let me tell you something. Um, I won't say that this is how most people do it, but I will say this. This is how a lot of people try to deal with their sin. They try to cover it up. Now, we're not talking about worldly people here. We're not talking about those people who have never heard the gospel, uh, who are just so wicked they can never be. We're talking about Christian people who say they're one thing, but their lives contradict what their lips are saying. What do many people try to do? Oftentimes, they try to cover up their sins. Well, how do Christians, and you notice I have that in quotation marks, how do Christians try to 
quote, cover. I just told you, <laughs> the Bible actually just told us it's impossible to do because light exposes what is truly there. But how do Christians try to cover up their sins? The first thing they do is found in verse 6, by telling lies to other. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Well, we tell lies to other people. We say this. We want Christian friends to think that we are spiritual, and so we lie about our spiritual lives. We want them to think that we're walking in the light. So we lie to them. We lie to them, not only with our words, but we act like them when we're around them. But as soon as we get away from them, well, then we begin to act in a different way. But in order to try to cover up our sins, we try to make spiritual people think we're right with you. We're also spiritual. And in so doing, we're really lying to them. I'm lying to my brethren if I come in here and act like I'm not a sinner. I act like I'm, I've not done anything wrong if indeed I am living in sin. I, I'm lying to other people when I try to convince them I am what they are. But then sooner or later, chapter 1, verse 8 in order to try to cover up our sins, we have to begin telling lies to ourselves. If we say that we have no sin, what about it? We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Boy, it's getting more and more dangerous the further we go, isn't it? It's one thing for me to lie to you and try to convince you that I'm something I'm not. Because when I go home, I still know who I truly am. But when I take it to the second step, I begin now to lie to myself. It's possible for a Christian to be living in sin and yet convince himself that everything's just fine. For example, you think about in the Old Testament, David. He did what he did. He saw Bathsheba. He sent for her. He brought her to him. Uh, he committed fornication with her. She became pregnant. As we know, he ended up murdering her husband. And thought he had gotten away with all of these things. And if you would have, if you would have asked everybody else, then oh, David's a great spiritual king. And you know what? If you would have asked David at that point, guess what? He would have said, oh, yes, David is a great spiritual king. Well, how do we know? Because when Nathan the prophet came to him and told him the parable about the man who had plenty of sheep, but he had a visitor, and rather than using one of his sheep, he goes over and kills this guy's sheep, his prized possession, and presents it for his guests. How do we know David was convinced that he was a spiritual man? Because you remember what he said, this man is going to pay for what he did. What was he being? He was being spiritual. This man has to keep God's law. He's going to restore it all of these times. He's going to go and restore it. He's going to restore it more than what, than what he took. And all the time, Nathan is talking about David. As a matter of fact, he tells him, David, thou art the man. David had lied to others. He had lied to himself. Still, think about this. Keeping part of God's law and applying it to other people. Well, all this time, he was covering up a secret in his own life. He had convinced himself that he was walking in light while he was actually covered in darkness. Well, then the next step. Can it get worse than that? Look at chapter 1, verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Next step is lying to God. We've made ourselves to be liars. And now what are we striving to do? We're striving to make God a liar. We contradict his word that says all have sinned. And then we maintain all oh, oh, that is true, except me. <laughs> all have sinned, except me. And then we apply God's word to others, but we don't apply it to ourselves. And we make God a liar by saying, in essence, God, you say I need to live this way to get to heaven. I'm telling you, you're wrong. <laughs> Because I've convinced myself that the way I'm living, although it's in darkness, 
is good enough. So God, I'm going to heaven. And if you say I can't go to heaven like I am, when I'm saying I can, one of us is lying and God, it has to be you. You see, God lays it out. But then I say, no, this is how it really is. And you sit through a worship service untouched by the message of God's word. Are you highly critical of other Christians but resist applying the message of the Bible to your own life? These are good indications that you're striving not only to lie to others, but to deceive yourselves and lie to God. You see, what a person walking in the light would do, when something is brought to his attention from the word of God, that needs to be corrected in his life, rather than trying to cover it up. He says, you know what? That applies to me. I've not been doing that. Therefore, this is what I need to do. What must we do? We must, when we try to cover this sin, we must, first of all, be honest with ourselves and God. And then what losses describe this kind of person? What, what does he lose when a person tries to cover his sin rather than being honest with himself and with God? What losses are in this person's life? Number one, he loses the word. He stops doing the truth. Chapter one, verse six, he loses the truth. The truth that says is no longer in him. Then the truth turns into lies. Chapter one, verse 10. What else does he lose? He loses fellowship with God and God's people. Look at first John chapter one, verses six and seven. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of the son, Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. When we are in this condition, that is striving to cover up our sins, profess one thing, but to live a different thing. When we are walking in darkness, yet professing to be walking in light, what do we lose? We also lose fellowship with God and fellowship with his people. Have you ever noticed That there's just something different about fellowship with people of the same like precious faith. And then have you ever noticed when that's missing? You've seen it. Let me use this as an illustration, because you might be able to relate to this. Even among your physical family members, if a majority of your family is in Christ, but there's that one that's not, have you noticed that there's something missing in that relationship? Husband and wife, where one is a Christian and one is not, Something's missing. Yes, they can still have a decent marriage. Yes, they can still love each other. Yes, they can raise good children together. All of these things. But there's something missing when they're both not walking in the same direction with God. Then a Christian loses his character. Is it any wonder why God warns that he who covers his sin shall not prosper? Are you trying to cover your sin today? What's the second thing that you can do with your sins? Here's the right one. We can confess our sins. First John chapter 1. Look at verses 7 and then verse 9. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have a fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Verse 9. If we confess our sins, what about it? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what I want. Don't you? Rather than trying to cover up my sins, I would like to be cleansed from my sins. Wouldn't you? That's what we're doing. That's what we want to do. And so how do we do it? 
There's two titles that are used uh, for Jesus in our passage today. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. There's one title, advocate. Verse 2, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. These two great titles, advocate and propitiation. If you look up the word propitiation in a dictionary, a secular dictionary, you'll get the wrong definition. It is to appease wrathful gods, to appease wrathful gods. And so you get the idea, if you go by that definition of loan, that God is waiting for you to sin just so he can quickly destroy you. And then giving Jesus was just God's way to appease an irate, vengeful, hateful God. Do you look at your Christian life for that? God is hateful. He wanted to zap me. He wanted to kill me. But thank God for Jesus. That appeased a wrathful, hateful God. Then we read a passage, John chapter 3, verse 16. What does it say? For God so hated the world that he gave his only begotten son. Is that what it says? No. For God so loved the world. Why did Jesus die for me? Not because God hated me and had to just kill somebody. It was because God loved me. and Wanted what was best for me. That's propitiation. It's the satisfaction of God's holy law. God is light, verse 5, and cannot close his eyes to sin. But God is love, 1 John 4, verse 8. And he wants to save sinners. And so now... We are in a problem, aren't we? God cannot close his eyes to sin, but God loves me and does not want to destroy me, but rather to save me. So how then can a holy God uphold his own justice and still save sinners? It's the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. At the cross, God, in his holiness, judged sin, and in his love, he offers Jesus to be the savior of the world. God is just in that he punished sin, but is also loving in that he offers forgiveness through his son. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be what? The propitiation for our sins. Sin had to be punished because it does not agree with God's law. It goes against God. So in his love, God sent his son to take my place. Christ is the sacrifice for the sins of the world. But then our second title, he's only an advocate for Christians. Did you hear that? God sent his son for the entire world to be a propitiation, but his son is only an advocate to the children of God, to Christians. That word advocate is a beautiful, beautiful word, and it simply means one called alongside. It's talked about in John chapter 16 when talking about the Holy Spirit, the same word is here used one who walks alongside, one called alongside. When a man was summoned to court, he took an advocate with him to stand by his side and to plead his case. Jesus finished his work on earth, John chapter 17, verse 4, but he continues his work at the throne of God by doing what? Standing by our side. And pleading our case. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 through 16. He was tempted in all points like as we are. Yet he did not sin for what purpose? So he can take up our defense. God I know what it's like to be Mark. I know what it's like to be tempted in this way. I know what it's like. He's in my blood. We need to forgive him. Turn your Bibles and this is. We're getting close to the end here, but I want you to just spend some time in this. And let's, let's think about this and appreciate this 
And if you are in this relationship with God, where he is not only Jesus is your propitiation, but you're in a relationship, you're our children of his, you are a Christian, whereby Jesus is also your advocate. If you're in that relationship with him today, then you need to just stop and thank God. And if you're not, listen to this last great illustration. I can say that because I didn't come up with it. It comes directly from the word of God. Zechariah chapter 3. And let's look at verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest. Don't get this one confused with Joshua uh, of long ago with the spies and all of this. This is many years later. Joshua now is the name of this high priest. Israel had been unfaithful for years. Joshua is now a high priest. Standing before the angel, let me start all over. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. Now watch this. And Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed in filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and he spoke to those who stood before him saying, take away the filthy garments from him. And to him, he said, see, I have removed your iniquity from you and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and they put the clothes on him. And the angel of the Lord stood by. Then the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will Walk in my ways. If you will keep my command, then you shall also judge by my house and likewise have charge of my courts. I will give you places to walk among those who stand here. Does that not sound exactly like what we're studying? If you will walk in my ways, if you will keep my command. Here's the picture. Jesus stands at our side and he advocates for us and get this picture this is a picture of what takes place in heaven you've got satan they're accusing mark is this mark is that mark is this and then you've got your advocate jesus christ on the side of you saying yes mark was that he was dressed in those filthy robes but he was washed in my blood i gave him new robes satan i got up from the dead he's forgiven but yes, Mark is this, he's that. Yes, but he's confessed his sin. He was dressed in wicked robes. I have clothed him in my blood. Let's forgive him. See, when I try to cover up my sins and say they don't exist to you, to myself, and to God, I cover those up. And Satan accuses and accuses and accuses. And the horrible thing about it is he's right every single time. And I've got no defense. I've got no one to take my case. Satan wins. As far as I'm concerned. But when I confess my sins. I'm baptized into the blood of Christ. I do for my Lord what he did for me. He died. He was buried. He was resurrected. When I'm baptized, I'm born again. I die. I'm buried. I'm resurrected. He stands by my side. And he takes up my case. If we confess our sins, listen to this. It's not just about you. Listen, he is faithful. He is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Where does the forgiveness come from? can't pop my buttons and say, man, I am so good, so much better than most. That's covering up my sins. But when I say I'm a sinner, I have failed. I'm dressed in filthy robes. I confess this to you. He is faithful. He is just. 
to forgive me. Why? Because he said that he would. And it's impossible for him to lie. To confess sin is more than just saying with my mouth, yeah, I'm a sinner, I've done wrong. To confess my sins means that I am saying the same thing about sin that God says about sin. Sin is our enemy. There's an old preacher story. I'm sure it was just an illustration used. I don't know if it actually happened or not, but the preacher said that a lady came forward, or a man, whichever it was, and said uh, he wanted forgiveness and said, if I have sinned, and the preacher said, no, nah, there's no if to it. Well, let's do it this way. Uh, if we have sin, and the preacher said, no, don't drag me into it too. The guy finally had to say, I have sinned. And the preacher says, now you're on to something. If you have not been washed in the blood of Christ today, why not confess your sins? Be washed in the blood. We, we have everything and have tried to make it as convenient for you as we possibly can. We've got water. We've got clothes for you to change into. We've got towels. We'll sing some songs while you're getting ready so there won't be any delay. We tried to do it all. Why not submit your life to him and rather than just covering things up and trying to get to heaven in a way God says you cannot get there. Why not simply say, I confess. Be immersed in water for the remission of your sins and begin walking in the same direction that God is going. Or if at one time you obey the gospel, but you've gone back into darkness, today's the day to come home. Confess it. All together we stand and sing the song.